beginning with Michael A. Reynolds, the professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Princeton University and a senior fellow at FPRI. Reynolds is the author of Shattering Empires, The Clash and Collapse of the Ottoman and Russian Empires, 1908 to 1918, which was the co-winner of the 2011 American Historical Association's prestigious George Louis Beer Prize. Reynolds also works on contemporary issues related to Turkey, Kurdistan, Azerbaijan, and the Caucasus. He's held fellowships and grants from all number of places, including the Smith Richardson Foundation, Harvard University's Olin Institute for Strategic Studies, and uh, the Fulbright, and many others. Please help me welcome Michael Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, the mic is on, yes? Okay. Um, when I was, uh, when Telly uh, Helfon asked me to uh, speak on uh, the Ottoman Empire, I originally thought, well, how is it that I'm going to fill up uh, an hour's worth of time speaking about 600 years of history? So I decided if that wasn't challenging enough, I noticed that I was uh, the first on the schedule. And I thought, well, I can only start uh, before the Ottoman Empire and give some background to the Ottoman Empire. So um, with that, I decided to uh, speak uh, To give some uh, background the, uh, on the Middle East and prior to the Ottoman Empire, and I thought I would just point out to start with some um, of the physical, of the continuities and discontinuities in the Middle East. And the first I'd like to point out in terms of continuities is uh, with physical geography uh, is the question of rainfall. When we think of the Middle East, we always think of what comes to, to, to mind most commonly, of course, is, is deserts. Certainly, we don't think of uh, the Middle East as an area of lush uh, rainforest. And there is, in fact, a uh, good reason for that. As this map shows, the only major, the only areas that have uh, significant amounts of rainfall are uh, the Anatolian Plateau, which today we think of as uh, Turkey, and then the uh, Iranian uh, Plateau. The uh, Why is this significant? Well, if you want to support uh, populations, you need to feed them. And in order to feed large numbers of people, really you need agriculture. And for agriculture, of course, uh, you need uh, water. Rain is one way to get it. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, when you think the, the, the two of the three largest uh, states in the Middle East today, uh, one of them is Turkey, uh, another is Iran, both roughly speaking uh, close to 80 million uh, people. And that's no accident, because these are uh, two areas that have uh, significant amounts of rainfall. They have significant amounts of water, which is necessary for agriculture. The third largest state in the Middle East is Egypt, which does not have uh, much rain, but does have the Nile River. And this has supported agriculture in Egypt for uh, millennia. And uh, <clears throat> Egypt, along with uh, the Anatolian Plateau, in Iran have always supported large, uh, relatively speaking, large populations. And that's something that has uh, been the pattern in the Middle East now, uh, again, uh, for millennia. And when we think of the three largest uh, states today in the Middle East, they are uh, Turkey, Iran, and Egypt, all uh, roughly uh, about 80 uh, million people. But although we think of the Middle East as uh, oftentimes, when we think of the Middle East, we think of uh, tradition, ancient lands, uh, a place that has not changed much, this is really uh, quite I inaccurate. Uh, in terms of uh, physical geography, excuse me, rather human geography, you can, in, within the last uh, 2,000 years, we've seen really quite major uh, changes in the, in the physical, uh, excuse me, the, the human uh, geography of the Middle East. Uh, most his, uh, introductory courses on Middle Eastern history often talk of the, were the three big uh, groups in the Middle East in terms of uh, eth ethno-linguistic groups. And those are uh, the Arabs, the Turks, and the Persians. But really only one of them, if you were to go back uh, 2,000 years, only one of them you would see is uh, a major presence um, in the Middle East. And that is the, uh, the, the Persians. Uh, the Persians, of course, are known uh, to us through uh, the Greeks as being a, a rival. 
Uh, they were then after the ancient Greece. We had the uh, Sassanid Empire, as this map here shows, a major rival uh, with the Roman and Byzantine uh, empires. And the Persians, uh, the point being that the Persians have been here for quite some, have been in the Middle East for really essentially as long as recorded history. Uh, the Persians are uh, Indo-Europeans, uh, speak an Indo-European language. Uh, that is, the Iranian language is part of the same uh, language grouping as English uh, and other European languages. Uh, <clears throat> you'll notice some words uh, in common, basic words, brader, pader. Uh, those are Iranian for uh, brother uh, and father. And um, <clears throat> what would, if you were to look at the Middle East prior to the seventh century, uh, of our era, uh, you wouldn't see a significant, this is, is basically a, a map here, you have the Roman and Byzantine em empires here, uh, heavily uh, Greek speaking, and then you have the uh, Sassanid Persian Empire, and you wouldn't find, you wouldn't think of the Middle East as being a, a region dominated by Arabs, which is, of course, today, that's when people first think of the Middle East, they think, oh, uh, that's the land where uh, the Arabs live. So how did this change. Why is it that if you were to go back in the 6th century, uh, you would not have thought of the Middle East as an Arab uh, region, but something quite different? Well, that does change in the uh, 7th century, where you have the emergence uh, inside of uh, what we know as the Arabian uh, <clears throat> Peninsula. A religious movement begins there, led by someone by the name of Muhammad, who uh, claims that he has a to be a messenger of God and that he is bringing the final revelation uh, to humanity. He rallies the uh, inhabitants, uh, Bedouin tribesmen in Arabia, to his side, uh, unites them behind him in this uh, belief that he has the final revelation from God, and they go on a uh, campaign of conquest that at the end of the time of Muhammad's death, they have conquered uh, this much territory uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. It's by uh, 632, so in a matter of, of 10 years. And then with another couple of decades, uh, his followers, his successors have uh, conquered uh, this area, sort of this lighter uh, orangey color. And then by 750, they have conquered these areas of, all through North Africa, including Spain and then going out to what we uh, today often call South Asia, that is the Indian uh, subcontinent, and into uh, what today we often refer to as uh, Central Asia. And it's really, it's only after this process, these, the, the Arab uh, Muslim uh, conquest, is when the uh, populations living in these territories that today we think of the Arab world, North Africa, Egypt, uh, Syria, Iraq, etc that uh, Arab become, Arabic becomes the uh, dominant uh, language. And that's a process that takes uh, some time uh, to unfold. Now, Arabic is a, a Semitic language, and certainly Semitic languages aren't new at all to the Middle East. The Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, uh, Syriac have been spoken there uh, for, for, uh, for quite some time. Um, but the, the point I just wanted to get across is that the dominance of the Arabs uh, and Arab uh, language and culture in the Middle East is one that is, is a relatively new, historically speaking, is a relatively new uh, development. Um, now the Arabs, Muhammad's followers, uh, as I mentioned, uh, were Bedouin. They are nomadic peoples. Uh, they were tremendously successful in conquering uh, these territories, and looking at this in terms of uh, world conquest, this is certainly one of the greatest and, and, and most fantastic, is how quickly uh, they are able to conquer such a large amount of territory. But that uh, creates problems uh, <clears throat> uh, for people who are used to living as, as, as Bedouin, as nomads, and now have a tremendous amount of territory to control and to administer. And one of the ways that they, uh, uh, what, what they had to do in order to uh, figure out how, how, do we, how do we hold these lands together is they uh, drew upon the, the Sassanids, that is the empire uh, that had been in existence here after conquering Iran. They, they convert the population there uh, to Islam 
and begin employing the administrators. And this is where you see the beginnings of uh, Islamic civilization, which is a synthesis of this Arab Muslim element with the uh, older uh, Persian uh, imperial uh, aspects uh, to it. Now, on this, in this period, uh, so let's say 750, you don't see any, you wouldn't see, if you were to again be in the Middle East, you would really, you wouldn't come across uh, any Turks. They're essentially uh, not a factor uh, in the Middle East. Um, the Turks are relatively late, uh, are, are latecomers, not just to the Middle East, but uh, you know, to uh, world history. Um, the first incontrovertible piece of evidence we have that testifies to the existence of a uh, people who are uh, called Turks uh, dates from the seventh century. So again, uh, that's not that, that's really quite uh, new. Uh, the Turks originated in the area that we uh, you know Mongolia. So up here, and it's from there that they then uh, begin to uh, move into uh, Central Asia, uh, and then down into Iran. Of course, there were also the, for centuries the Turks had both coexisted. Uh, with the Chinese and also served as rivals uh, with uh, the Chinese. Uh, the Turkic languages are not uh, related at all to Indo-European languages. Uh, most linguists classify them um, as Alt Alt Altaic um, because they share, uh, some many linguists believe they share fundamental uh, similarities uh, to Japanese and Korean. So they have nothing linguistically, there's nothing in common between uh, the, the Turkic language groups uh, and the Semitic ones, or uh, the Indo-European uh, ones. Now, the uh, Turks are a nomadic peoples. They're famous for their skill on horseback and their expertise as archers. Um, and as they began moving uh, from Central Asia down um, into Iran, one, they encountered Muslims and were gradually, uh, were gradually converted uh, to Islam. And they learned much of their Islam from uh, the Persians and much of their high culture uh, they adopted from uh, the Persians. The Persians, after all, having been the settled populations uh, for thousands of years. And the impact of Persian and Iranian civilization on uh, even the Turks in, in Turkey today is, uh, is revealed in the basic language that the Turks use uh, for Islam. Uh, well, two of the most basic, just to use two, two small examples, um, two of the most fundamental parts of Islam. Uh, one is, is prayer, of course, and the word that the Turks use uh, for prayer is not the Arabic salah, but rather namaz, which they adopted uh, from the Persians. Another uh, fundamental uh, practice of Islam is fasting, and the Arabic word for fasting is salm. However, uh, the Turks use the Persian word aruch. And this sort of illustrates the, uh, you know, quite uh, graphically, clearly, concretely, uh, the influence of uh, Iranian and um, Persian uh, civilization and culture upon the Turks. And they picked this up as they were moving from uh, Central Asia uh, through Iran and uh, then uh, into Anatolia. Now, is there coming in through uh, Iran, they ran up into Anatolia, it was still at this time uh, held by the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantines, for some time, were able, essentially, to keep the, the Turks out of Anatolia until uh, the Battle of Manzikert uh, in 1071, where a group of Turks known as the Seljuk Turks uh, defeated the Byzantines. And this is usually cited by historians as the moment when the uh, Turkification of Anatolia begins in, um, in, in earnest. Uh, <clears throat> so it's after 1071. Anatolia is open for settlement, and Turkic tribes begin to push into the uh, Anatolian plateau and settle it. So again, this area that we think of Turkey a thousand years ago, uh, you would have found you know, quite few uh, Turks living there. In fact, you would found in terms of uh, you find many different peoples, but the predominant ones, uh, the dominant ones would be uh, Greek uh, Greek speakers. You would also have found uh, Armenians there uh, as well. Now, skipping ahead from the beginning of Turkification in Anatolia in 1071, 
to the uh, Ottoman Empire, which uh, is the date usually found, cited as the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, or perhaps better, more technically speaking, the beginning of the Ottoman dynasty, is 1299. And that's when uh, a Turkish tribal chief by the name of Osman, this is the Turkish pronunciation of an Arabic name, uh, Othman, where there's this uh, certain TH sound. Uh, this is why the Ottomans call, uh, call them, uh, well, oh, you use the name Osman, um, and speak of not the Ottoman Empire, but the Osmanla Empire. Why do we say Ottoman? Well, it's because the, the Arabic, this TH sound, um, doesn't quite exist in, in English, at least not commonly. So uh, we have on the one side the Turks saying um, Osman, and then we have in the European language is Ottoman, and the Arabic uh, Arabs, uh, pronunciation being Uthman, it's an Arabic name. Uh, <clears throat> so if you're, you're curious why the Ottomans say Osman, why do we say Ottoman? Uh, that's that's the, the reason. Um, so 1299, this Turkish tribal chief uh, named Osman founds a dynasty, not in the center of Anatolia, but in western Anatolia. You can see here the uh, brown uh, <clears throat> territory. And what I think is significant to note about this, this map that shows the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, so sort of the brown color, then to the orange, then to this sort of light yellow, is that I think contrary to what most people assumed, certainly I used to uh, had assumed that the, the Ottoman Empire and Turkey are more or less the same things. And so you imagine probably somewhere, let's say around Konya or today's capital of Turkey, Ankara, uh, the Turks probably formed. And from there, they then went and expanded into, the, into uh, what we think of today, the Middle East, uh, into the Arab lands. And then after that, uh, launched themselves into the Balkans. And in fact, it's virtually precisely the opposite. That is, the uh, dynasty is founded here in the uh, western Anatolia and begins to expand the western Anatolia. And within uh, the first several decades, they are already very solidly established in, in the Balkans. And the point here is that the Ottoman Empire, from its beginnings, is as much uh, a Balkan empire. And I agree, let's say, if we were going to draw a distinction between the Balkans and the Middle East, say it's more of a Balkan empire than it is a Middle uh, Eastern uh, Empire. And this has uh, significance for the uh, breakup of the Ottoman Empire, which if I don't have time uh, to get into in my uh, remarks, uh, my prepared remarks, uh, certainly I'd be happy to answer uh, questions about that. Um, <clears throat> so the stages of expansion, just to run through those uh, quickly of the Ottoman Empire, um, 1453, is when the Ottomans conquer Constantinople, uh, Constantine city, uh, a Roman uh, Byzantine city. And that's certainly, at this point, we can speak of the Ottoman Empire really as, 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 as a true uh, empire. Um, and then it was in uh, 1517 where uh, the Ottomans then go on to conquer uh, Mamluk Egypt, as well as the territories that the, the Levant, the territories we think of today, as being uh, Israel, the West Bank, uh, Jordan, uh, et cetera, and Iraq. Then under the uh, Sultan uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, the, um, uh, the empire uh, you know, expands further into North Africa, further into uh, Mesopotamia, that is what we think of today as Iraq, and then into uh, Europe, uh, <coughs> to the gates of Vienna, and uh, in, and to Hungary. Now that's quite a, uh, as you can tell by this map, that's quite a large territory. I mentioned numerous uh, countries that today are independent. And I'd also just like to underscore, this is not simply a great deal of territory. It's also territory that is uh, profoundly uh, mixed in terms of geography have in territories, you know, the, the Balkans are geographically very you know, uh, hilly, much more uh, fertile lands than are the uh, territories of, let's say, of North Africa. Of course, uh, Egypt with the Nile is quite different from um, Arabia uh, out in eastern Anatolia. Again, very different geography. Uh, the Caucasus Mountains, Hungary, et cetera. So you have a tremendous amount of geographic diversity. And then you have as much uh, human uh, diversity. Uh, the, the numbers of uh, groups of people vary in terms of uh, ethnicity, vary in terms of language, 
Uh, they vary tremendously in terms of religion, and they vary, perhaps most importantly, in terms of lifestyle. That you have uh, peop some people living in cities, you have uh, nomads, uh, you have uh, people living in mountains, etc. In other words, this is an extraordinarily uh, diverse uh, empire in terms of both human geography and in physical geography, and yet the Ottomans are able to meet, hold on to this for several uh, centuries. So and they're in the Middle East for roughly uh, four centuries. So one of the questions is, uh, you know, how are the Ottomans able to, to do this? How did they hold uh, all of this uh, together? And the two basically, the, the kind of two fundamental answers to, uh, to that question are one, uh, a large degree of flexibility, and then also a certain uh, form of uh, tolerance. Um, in terms of uh, so flexibility, what do I mean by that? Well, one um, <clears throat> way in which the Ottomans were quite flexible um, was that they had multiple sor sources of law. Now, the Ottomans were uh, Sunni Muslims, and they regarded their state as an, as an Islamic state, and particularly after the conquest of the uh, Arab lands, where they encountered uh, settled populations that had been uh, studying Islam for centuries and had developed really quite sophisticated ways of thinking about religion and the ways in which uh, religion should influence and shape uh, people's lives. Uh, the Ottomans take their calling as Sunni Muslims quite uh, uh, seriously, and they uh, <clears throat> hold Islamic law as the supreme law of the empire. So they have, that's one uh, important source and the most important source of law in the Ottoman Empire. However, it's not the only one. Uh, Islamic law, as, as uh, sophisticated and as, um, as broad as it may be, of course, does not have an answer, ready answer to all the problems that uh, someone ruling the empire might face. So the Ottomans were able to draw on their own uh, pre-Islamic traditions, their Turkic traditions, um, wherein the ruler had always had the prerogative in, in, uh, among the Turks of issuing, essentially making law on his own. This is uh, called uh, yasa. And so the sultan was regarded as having uh, the authority of uh, being a, a, a law giver on his own. So in cases where they needed to come up with uh, laws, the sultan could simply uh, issue them. Um, <clears throat> which, if, if you're ruling in the, dealing with uh, very varied populations and uh, contingencies, that can be a tremendously uh, useful, uh, <clears throat> a useful um, or a practice uh, to be able to uh, issue laws as, as you see fit. Now, the, this is uh, a uh, portrait of uh, Sultan Suleiman, known in European sources as uh, the Magnificent. That's usually how the Europeans would speak of him. This, he was the one, the tenth uh, sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and often by historians we regard him as, as, uh, as presiding over with the, the, the golden age of the Ottoman Empire when the uh, empire reached its largest territorial extent. He was also very uh, regarded by the Ottomans, no less, as a great leader. But what I wanted to, to draw attention to, um, whereas he's known primarily in European sources as Suleiman the Magnificent, he is known in uh, Turkish primarily as Kanuni Sultan Suleiman, that is Sultan Suleiman, the lawgiver. The word uh, Kanun uh, might sound to you as a very uh, foreign word, but it's actually uh, one that we all know. It's the same word as uh, the Greek, uh, the same, it comes from Greek, and the same word that we use today as canon. Um, we speak of uh, canon law in Catholicism, or uh, the canon of great books. It's the same law, excuse me, it's the same word um, that the Ottomans uh, were, were using uh, and that they referred to their, uh, their, their greatest uh, sultan as Kanuni Sultan Suleiman. And this is, he was, uh, <clears throat> the point of this is that if sultan, Suleiman was the one who uh, sort of saw the, uh, the um, consolidation of Ottoman imperial administrations and through uh, you know, issuing laws, uh, established uh, the institutions that would then uh, dominate um, the, the empire uh, for uh, some time, for several uh, centuries. Um, 
Now the other, so one, is, so one of these forms of flexibility was that they had these alternative sources of, of law. The other uh, source of uh, flexibility that the Ottomans uh, had was that they were very attentive to local conditions and were very willing to modify their practices to accommodate uh, local uh, populations and to fit local conditions. So just to give uh, two examples, one on the island of Limnos, uh, which is a, a Greek island in, in the uh, Mediterranean. So again, this is a, a territory very different. Um, it has its own specific uh, peculiarities. On this island, uh, shepherds, uh, as opposed to the mo more common practice of keeping uh, basically male and female sheep uh, segregated until a certain part of time of the year when uh, they would be, uh, would be bred, shepherds on this island happened to, uh, to keep the males and females mixed. And this had the, the effect of um, <clears throat> basically pr producing ewes, lambs, uh, year round. Now, why is this a problem? Well, it's a, it was a problem for Ottoman tax collectors who were used to taking, counting up uh, livestock at a certain time of the year, because lambs weren't supposed to be um, taxed, only uh, full-grown sheep. So in order to accommodate this, uh, the, uh, the, local, the Ottoman local tax inspector uh, wrote to Istanbul and explained, well, look, the people here keep their uh, sheep, males and females, together. So we're going to have to change our practices in counting the sheep here. We're not going to simply count all the sheep by how many head uh, there are, but rather we're going to only count the ones that uh, are clearly not uh, lambs. Um, and it's this sort of minor attention to this. Was, uh, you know, Istanbul was fine with this. And this sort of minor attention to seemingly minor details was uh, one of the ways that the Ottomans were able to um, accommodate local groups and therefore avoid coming into a constant uh, conflict um, with local populations, or at least I should minimize uh, the conflict that they had with local populations. Um, another sort of example of this might be in um, uh, the areas in, in Palestine. Olive trees were taxed uh, not uh, were taxed only according to their age, because the uh, fruitfulness of a tree would vary according to age. And to again to accommodate that, the uh, Ottomans would uh, vary their tax rates according um, to the to the age of uh, the trees. So, and this was throughout the empire. There were ad hoc agreements often made with the local leaders, be they uh, village chiefs, uh, be they local notables, uh, tribal leaders. Um, Etc. An area that I work on, uh, Eastern Anatolia, uh, where you have a large uh, Kurdish population. There, the Ottomans were quite happy to let the Kurdish tribes more or less live as, as they wanted, as long as they simply paid uh, you know, annual tribute uh, to Istanbul, pledged their loyalty to the Sultan. They were able to pretty to to live uh, as they wanted. They didn't have to pay too much attention to it. Uh, people in Istanbul were saying this. In Istanbul wasn't trying to interfere in their um, everyday lives. Uh, so it's this indirect rule and ad hoc uh, accommodation of local practices uh, worked very well for many centuries. It's only at the end of the 18th and then in the 19th century where it becomes problematic because this is at the time when you have the emergence of uh, modern, uh, what would become nation states in Europe that are realizing uh, great uh, efficiencies through homogenization of uh, populations. And, and this homogenization begins to yield benefits in, uh, in the economic, administrative, and uh, military spheres. And then the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century is, is to uh, engage in the process of sort of trying to uh, catch up to and adapt to the new practices in state administration that are, it, uh, <clears throat> that are uh, pioneered uh, by uh, the Europeans. And this is one of the factors that contributes to the uh, breakup of, of, of the empire. Uh, and again, I'd be happy to, in the questions and answers, I'd be happy uh, to speak about that in more detail. Um, the other uh, major factor that contributed to the stability of the Ottoman Empire was that what's often called uh, tolerance. And this is, you know, tolerance uh, is one of these words that um, has a great deal of, uh, of meanings. Um, <clears throat> the tolerance here refers particularly to a, uh, a limited form of religious tolerance. Now, why religious? Uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, in the time of the Ottoman Empire, ethnicity was not, a, it was not politically significant. Uh, 
although we often think of the Ottoman Empire as a Turkish empire, that's in many ways that's a very flawed uh, concept. Uh, the Ottomans themselves didn't think of themselves as Turks first and foremost. Yes, the, the language, uh, the primary uh, language in which they ruled was a Turkic language, Ottoman Turkish, although it's a language that had uh, draw, drew upon um, Arabic and Persian heavily, both for vi vocabulary and um, in terms of many uh, sayings and even grammar. So the Ottoman, Ottoman Turkish was very much a hybrid of uh, Turkish with uh, Arabic and uh, Persian. But the, so the language was Turkish. The, the self-identity of the Ottomans um, was not uh, as, as ethnic uh, Turks. In fact, the word uh, Turk in, uh, for the Ottomans up until the very last uh, years of the empire was, uh, if anything, would be a term, uh, if not abuse, um, it was a, a term of, uh, it referred, was used reserved for uh, peasants, essentially un, un, unlettered, uh, peasants uh, who happened to be Turkish, speaker, Turkish speakers. If you were a uh, civil servant or a military figure or other official in the Ottoman Empire, you would have called yourself an Ottoman, um, not as a, a, a Turk. Um, and many of the, the, the uh, <clears throat> members of the Ottoman elite um, were drawn from non-Turkic groups. So you'd have Arabs there, people of um, uh, Circassian, uh, that is uh, from the Caucasus, um, Georgian, um, from the Balkans, Albanians, all, all various kinds of people from the Balkans, um, uh, Bosnians, etc. Et, et, et so ethnicity was not, uh, didn't have any political uh, imp uh, significance, really. Uh, religion, however, certainly uh, did. Uh, as I mentioned, the Ottomans uh, saw them, they, they were Muslims saw their empire as a as, as, as an, uh, Muslim empire, as an Islamic empire. Um, Islamic law was the dominant uh, law in the empire. And according to Islamic law, Muslims are uh, regarded as our, we call it essentially our, our privileged uh, population. They are uh, legally superior uh, to, to non-Muslims. However, uh, those non-Muslims uh, who were regarded as uh, also um, <clears throat> participants in the Abrahamic uh, traditions that also were recipients of our uh, followers of the Abrahamic tradition, that is in particular Jews and Christians, were regarded as uh, legitimate uh, religions. That is essentially from the, the, this, the view of, um, of Islam, Judaism and Christianity um, are not completely incorrect. They're sort of corrupted messages of what was, uh, what was the message that was given to humanity by God. But then uh, both the Jews and the Christians, for, for various reasons, didn't get it exactly right. And that's why uh, there had to be a final revelation from Muhammad. But nonetheless, the, for the view of, of Islam, uh, Jews and Christians are, are doing some things correct. And therefore, uh, they should be permitted uh, to maintain their religion and to maintain um, their uh, traditions. So uh, they're regarded as people of, uh, of the book. <clears throat> now, the, so the Ottomans, uh, with their subject Christian and Jewish uh, populations, although they certainly had to be, uh, were legally uh, second class, were nonetheless given a form of autonomy. That is, they were permitted to rule themselves according to their own uh, religious laws. So this is what's known as the millet system. So in, in terms of uh, Ottoman uh, legal practice, you had uh, Sunni Muslims were the dominant group and the legally privileged group. But then you also had um, an Armenian millet because the uh, Armenians had their own church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, which is separate from uh, the Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox uh, Church. So they were uh, one uh, millet. And this, what this meant was that the Armenians were essentially left to administer their internal affairs on their own. Now, if there was any uh, legal conflict between the Muslim and the non-Muslim, well, that would be, uh, those cases would be resolved in an Islamic course, a court. But if there were two Armenians, let's say, that had a dispute, they could, if they preferred, uh, resolve that uh, dispute um, within their own community. Um, Likewise, there was an Armenian uh, millet. There was also an Orthodox Christian millet. Um, it was primarily, predominantly Greek-speaking, but you also had um, Arabic, uh, Arab uh, Orthodox Christians. 
And so that was uh, the second uh, major uh, millet. And then the, the third was a, a Jewish one. And now, when I'm speaking, I should mention that these uh, groups, um, when I say they're able to live autonomously, uh, this isn't in terms of territory. Uh, Armenians, uh, Orthodox Christians, and Jews were lived in all various parts of the empire. So this is a form of legal and cultural autonomy, not a form of uh, territorial. Now, the Ottomans, as I mentioned, um, were uh, Sunni Muslims, which they took quite seriously. Um, and one of the things that really propelled them uh, to taking uh, their identity as Sunni Muslims uh, even more seriously was the uh, formation on their, to the east of the uh, Safavid uh, state in Iran. Um, and again, this is if you go back to the first slide that I showed, uh, you had, uh, I showed the, the rainfall and made the point that uh, Anatolia and the Iranian plateau are two areas that have always supported large population groups. Uh, if you remember, I had the slide after that showing um, the Byzantine, the Roman Byzantine Empire uh, over here. And then uh, there was the empire called the Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire over here. And you see this pattern, uh, the point there I just wanted to uh, bring out to you is you see this pattern again reasserting itself with the emergence of a Safavid state uh, uh, in, on the Iranian plateau. And this happened in 1501 when someone by the name of Ismail, uh, <clears throat> backed by some tribes uh, and, and influenced by uh, Islamic uh, mysticism, emerges and establishes a new dynasty that calls itself um, the Safavids. Now, it's not clear, and, and they adopt uh, Shi uh, Shi Islam, and this is its from the beginning of the 16th century when we see the conversion of Iran from Sunni Islam to Shiism. Of course, we think today of Iran as being uh, predominantly a, a Shiite uh, country. Uh, that, is, and, and too, is a relatively uh, new uh, development in history that, again, begins in the beginning of the uh, 16th century. The other interesting thing about the Safavids, uh, though it's, it, it's not known exactly who they were in terms of uh, ethnicity, uh, most scholars actually think they were probably uh, Turkic tribesmen uh, that emerged uh, and uh, established this dynasty. Uh, a few say they might have been uh, the Shah Ismail and his followers perhaps were, were, were Kurdish. Um, what's interesting to point out here is that when the Safavids emerge as rivals to the Ottomans and the Safavid Shah Ismail is corresponding with his uh, Ottoman counterparts, Shah Ismail writes in, um, in Turkic because that was the language he was most comfortable with. And in fact, he's regarded as the founder of uh, uh, Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijani Turkish uh, literature. So he's writing in, 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 in Turkic, and the, the, his Ottoman uh, sultan, his counterpart, uh, Ottoman sultan uh, Selim the Grim, is writing in Persian. Why is that? Because, well, the Ottomans uh, regarded Persian as really the ultimate, uh, as, as the, the language of the court, the language of high civilization. So all Ottoman sultans and uh, high-level Ottoman officials were all uh, very fluent and comfortable with Persian, and they, in fact, felt more comfortable in writing uh, the uh, Safavids in Persian. So you have this uh, case where the uh, Ottoman, what we think of the Turkish sultan, is writing in Persian, and then the head of the uh, Safavid Persian Empire is writing in Turkic as they're, uh, they're corresponding. Um, <clears throat> and the emergen, uh, emergence of the Safavid state, which uh, was uh, as a Shiite state, a rival to the Ottomans, is one of the things that pushes the Ottomans to start emphasizing their uh, Sunni identity and taking that much stronger because they realize in order to, uh, get, to rally more legitimacy to themselves, they need to um, put an emphasis upon this, uh, their, their Sunni uh, character and, and take that uh, more uh, seriously. So that strengthened the Ottoman Sunni uh, identity, strengthened um, and particularly after, so with the rivalry with the Safavids. And then, as I mentioned earlier, after the conquest of the Arab lands of the Levant, Syria, and Egypt um, in the 16th century, uh, they begin importing Arabic uh, scholars of Islam um, to Istanbul and elsewhere in the empire and begin to pay more rigorous, uh, greater attention 
and uh, more rigorous attention um, to the uh, demands um, of Islam and Islamic law. And you can see this in uh, the language that the Ottomans use in their administration. You begin to see more and more Arabic terms begin to displace uh, the Persian um, terms. Now, this creates a, a, uh, a problem in the Ottoman um, uh, millet system. So I mentioned here you have, uh, you have Muslims, uh, Armenian Christians, Orthodox Christians, and uh, Jews. But what do you do with Shiite Muslims? Well, the fact is you can't do anything with them because this is regarded as not a legitimate form of uh, religion. So you, the Shiite populations, uh, particularly in areas uh, Lebanon, which have a significant uh, amount of uh, <coughs> Shiites, Iraq, and um, uh, in the borderlands uh, with, uh, with Iran, which the Ottomans at various times uh, controlled. Uh, Yemen, uh, another area where you had uh, some Shiite populations. These populations were, uh, along with another, other groups, um, the um, Alevi, uh, there's a group in um, Anatolia, and then you have the Alawites. They're not the same, the Alevis, and, and just to make things even more confusing, right? Uh, the Alevis living in the, the center of, uh, in the central Anatolia and eastern Anatolia, and then you have the uh, Alawis in, um, in Syria. They, along with the Shiites, are, are regarded by the Ottoman state as uh, not essentially not legitimate populations. And uh, there emerged uh, among these populations of the very tense relations um, with the Ottoman state, because the Ottomans and Sunni Muslims could not accommodate them easily. And this sets, a, um, uh, sets up a legacy uh, of where these populations are, simply, are essentially dispossessed, uh, both uh, particularly in, in Lebanon and uh, then in uh, the territories that later become the, uh, the state of Iraq. So they are administered by um, Sunnis. Uh, <clears throat> no uh, Shiites are, serve in the government, um, but nonetheless, there are significant uh, populations there. And then with the post-Ottoman order, uh, this becomes a problem, one that is, 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 is uh, continuing. I don't want to, maybe I could say, I, don't, I was about to say working itself out today. Oh, I don't know if we would say the uh, conflicts that have been uh, occurring in, in Lebanon uh, in Syria and Iraq are exactly working out of this problem. Um, perhaps a better, better way to put it is simply this problem is, is manifesting um, itself uh, today. Um, let me just very quickly uh, uh, open up for questions. I mean, I could go, this is getting now into more of my uh, area of uh, specialization, that is the last decades of the empire and the breakup and dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but rather than go on about this at length, I'll um, speak rather quickly. Um, this is simply showing uh, the, uh, the last the quarter century of the uh, Ottoman Empire, 1878 to 1913, and the amount of territories that they, they lose. Now, I mentioned that in, in Europe, you had this greater uh, new forms of state administration, uh, technological breakthroughs, uh, breakthroughs, economic advances, and uh, military as well. The Ottomans trying to catch up with that. They carry out a, a number of reforms uh, throughout the 19th century, but they can't quite do them uh, quickly enough, and they start losing these territories. And you can see here the uh, territories, again, that they lose from 1878 to 1913. These territories, as I mentioned, you remember that first map that I showed, that showed the Ottoman Empire had its beginnings in this uh, territory, the Balkans. Um, so it wasn't as when the Ottomans lost these territories, said, oh, okay, well, you know, we lost the Balkans. It was never really ours to begin with, and we understand we weren't really uh, legitimate rulers. To the contrary, uh, the, uh, many of them, of the Ottoman elite, were born and grew up here and had been living there, uh, and traced their origins back for 400 years. So when they lost these lands, it wasn't, again, as if they lost colonial dependencies. This was what they saw as their heartland. Um, so the loss, is, the loss of these lands was very bitter. Making it even more bitter was the fact that the, uh, with this emphasis upon greater homogenization of populations that really begins to take off in the 19th century, you have mass ethnic cleansing of Muslims uh, from the Balkans and also from the Caucasus as the Russian Empire had been pushing down from here. The refugees from these areas end up in the Ottoman Empire uh, and they take the message that, look, this is a truly dog-eat-dog -dog world, 
and we are going to have to change radically if we're going to uh, survive, because if this process continues, what we're going to see is something, and in fact, this is what was intended for the uh, Ottoman Empire in World War I, was the final partition. And you can see here, the, uh, all that would have been left would have been some kind of uh, Turkish uh, state, a rump of the Ottoman Empire. And the rest of this would have been territories would have been divvied up uh, to the great, by the great powers. And this um, greatly frightened uh, the population, the, the Ottomans, and essentially pushed them to adapt a radically secularizing project because they, they, in the 19th century, began to see Islam as something that was holding them back, making them weaker, and that they needed to uh, purge uh, politics and society of religious influence, and also to engage on the project of homogenization of the population and uh, Turkification of the population. And it's during this uh, World War I where you have the, and in the years immediately after, uh, where you have um, the, essentially the uh, destruction of the Armenian population that was about 25% of uh, the population now here in Anatolia. And then the uh, mass, great mass of uh, Greek, Orthodox Greek Christians um, were expelled. So another sort of uh, major human geographical discontinuity in the Middle East would be the um, uh, elimination of, uh, of, of Christianity. Um, so that's a process that was still going quite strong in the 20th century and is one that we can still see, um, unfortunately, taking place uh, today in the contemporary, uh, today's Middle East. And with that, why don't I, I end here? I think I've gone on for 45 minutes and uh, take uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, we're open for questions. Since this is being live streamed, we need you to uh, speak directly into the microphone, which uh, Peter and Megan are roaming around with. So if you could raise your hand or actually tilt your 10 card vertically, uh, we'll be able to get around to all of you. While you're thinking, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, uh, you said, according to Islamic law, Muslims are legally superior to non-Muslims. I'm wondering if that question is bounded by time and geography or not? I, I, um, I suppose the, the easy answer for that would be to say I'm not a uh, scholar, uh, I'm not a, a Muslim religious authority myself, so perhaps the practice could be changed. But um, historically, uh, the fact that the Muslims are regarded as, a, as um, legally superior. And this isn't, I mean, I should point out, this is not a question of, uh, of mere um, chauvinism. It's a reflection of the fact that Muslims believe that they have the final revelation from God, that this is God's will, um, and it's their duty to uh, bring that revelation to people. And that, again, if you're living according to Christianity or, or Judaism, um, you're not living exactly as God uh, believes you should live. Uh, so therefore, there, um, you know, it, it's not the Muslim belief in the legal superior, superiority of Muslims is not because Muslims are... Um, uh, superior by nature of birth, but rather by nature of their uh, belief, and that Jews and Christians are persisting in error. And therefore, to acknowledge them as somehow legal uh, to Muslims would be um, a, 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 a sin against God and a violation of God's intent. Now, that's, and I should point out, and one of the things of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, um, uh, one of the um, innovations of, of the empire was, in fact, to introduce legal uh, <clears throat> legal equality for all Ottoman uh, subjects, regardless of religion. So, I mean, you know, when they when discuss the legal superiority of Muslims, that's from a theological perspective. In terms of uh, political, uh, certainly that is something that plenty of uh, um, you know, Muslim uh, governments have have recognized. And this is, in, in the Ottomans, in fact, um, uh, adopt this principle of equality of uh, all Ottoman subjects, regardless of religion, in the 19th century. So that, does that answer? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, Julie Kimmel. I'm going to ask you for a little bit of help. I was taking notes, and I got a great list of core ways that the Ottomans held this empire together. But I'm wondering if you could recap the top reasons why it fell apart. 
Oh, that, that's why that's a um, no, it's an excellent question. It's a, it's a, it's a um, complex one. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to how they do this in um, uh, quickly. I would. I think the key thing is, I mean, this is my perspective, is that the empire really didn't fall apart, but was rather torn apart. And this is, uh, and it was torn apart because the Ottomans fell behind um, the Europeans, um, first and foremost militarily. Um, but then when you started looking, say so it wasn't simply a question of uh, uh, military technology, uh, military organization, uh, but behind that also lay uh, economic reasons as well. So. Um, European societies, uh, the European states became, um, you know, in the 17th, 18th, and then certainly in the 19th centuries, became vastly more uh, powerful across the board, uh, let's say primarily economically and military, and were therefore able to um, <clears throat> impose their will upon on the Ottoman Empire. And as they grew stronger, um, one of the things that they were able to do to uh, break up the empire was they were able to make uh, pitches to various groups uh, within the Ottoman Empire uh, and encourage them to uh, think about breaking away from the empire. So that was one, um, that some of the, the constituent groups of the M Ottoman Empire began thinking, well, do we want to remain under the Ottomans, or do we want to maybe uh, collaborate uh, with the great powers and break away from the empire? Now, you, oftentimes, those efforts um, where uh, groups begin to break away from the Ottoman Empire are presented as uh, being nationalist as being uh, as an assertion of an identity that was suppressed by the Ottomans for centuries, and that now they have their chance. And this is usually the, the narrative that uh, peoples in, in the Balkans would give: that sort of the Ottomans were repressing us; they wouldn't let us live as Serbs, they wouldn't let us live as Bulgarians, as Greeks, etc. And then uh, we revolted. When you start looking more closely at the um, actual processes of uh, revolt. One of the triggers of uh, this process was the uh, Ottomans' own attempt to imitate the European states and introduce, introduce a more centralized rule. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the Ottomans were very flexible, largely let people, lo you know, local peoples do things the way they more or less wanted to, as long as they paid some annual taxes and more or less stayed loyal to the Sultan. In the 19th century, they say, we've got to become uh, more efficient we need to extract resources from um, all parts of our empire. And we need to introduce, to do that, we need to introduce centralized rule. And what are two things that states want? Um, one, they want taxes, which how many people here enjoy paying their taxes? Not, I imagine, I don't think too many hands would, would go up. Um, taxes are regarded, uh, I think, universally as um, uh, unfavorably. Uh, the second is conscription. And uh, not too many people generally uh, conscription. Um, <clears throat> well, you have to conscript people because it's not uh, military services often is not um, uh, desired uh, by people. So uh, when you have the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century beginning to imitate the Europeans by institutionalizing direct rural centralization, more modern, uh, effective uh, forms of administration, that involves uh, taxing people directly and then conscripting them. And that's what begins to prod uh, many of these groups to say, well, why should we remain part of this empire? We had an, an, a deal before that was OK, but now these guys in Istanbul are sending around their tax inspectors trying to take my money and trying to take either me or take my children and stick them in the army. And I don't want to be part of this thing anymore. And if we can break away from it, all the better. So it's a dual process, I'd say, of the uh, growth in European power and then the way that the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century begins to uh, try to reinvent itself as something closer to uh, a nation state. And that introduces all sorts of, uh, of difficulties. And so the more the Ottomans try to reform, in some ways, the more problems they run into. Hi. Um, my name is Todd Whitman. Um, I have a question about Shia residents of the Ottoman Empire. Um, you mentioned that they didn't have a millet, that there was a Jewish, Christian, Armenian millet. As such, were the Shia looked at as legitimate citizens of the empire, just part of maybe a corrupt religious sect? Is that correct? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would hesitate to give any uh, blanket statement. Um, certainly, you know, uh, formally, they're, they're never acknowledged as, as, as Sunni Muslims. But again, because the Ottomans would be willing to you know, look the other way and accommodate um, uh, Shias. You can find the Shia, Shia mosques, for example, in Istanbul. So it wasn't as if they uh, were persecuted constantly. But um, there, were, there, were, there were times of persecution. Um, and you know, depending upon you know the, the state of relations with the Safavid Empire, so in terms of peace, for example, the Shiite population, no big deal. That's fine. Maybe you know their their Islam is not exactly as it should be, but whatever. Um, it's not worth going after them. In term in terms of warfare, however, then suddenly they become a suspect population, and um, so I think that it, it varies. I mean, it's so, um, but they were, they were never formally acknowledged as on, as being on the same par as Sunni Muslims. But again, that shouldn't be regards. They were constant. They were they were hunted down. Um, that would be completely in, in, incorrect. But they would be considered citizens. Oh uh, well, that gets a little question. Citizens, citizen, and subject would be a, be, a better. A okay. Better term. Thank you. Mike Durant. Hey, Mike. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, the apparent contradiction between um, a, a an empire being an Orthodox Sunni empire. Um, and having a, a, a sultan that calls himself the lawgiver, given that um, it, that uh, Orthodox Muslims believe that all law comes from God. Well, that's a huge question. I can't really give you a um, uh, particularly. Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I can't give you the definitive answer to the, to, the, to that to that question. I mean, I guess the, the that's the question. How is how is I mean, if I could rephrase that, maybe the question is how did. Well, how legitimate was were the Ottomans regarded as, as Muslim rulers by? Is, is, would that be another way of rephrasing the question? Um, you know, I didn't mention one of the things that the Ottomans again to boost their legitimacy after they um, uh, conquer Egypt, they defeat the Mamluks and uh, take Egypt. The Ottoman Sultan then takes on the the, the claim to being the Caliph. That is the successor to Muhammad and the rightful uh, spiritual head of uh, the Muslim uh, community, the, the Ummah. That claim to be what uh, to being uh, to being the caliph was. I mean, it's problematic from a. Uh, I think it's fair to say a mainstream uh, Sunni perspective for a number of reasons, which uh, I, I won't get into. But among them being the fact that uh, the most uh, the the. the um, <clears throat> The, the Turks had no uh, claim to be to the lineage of Muhammad, um, and the fact that the Mamluk claim to the title of, of caliph was also quite uh, problematic. That was the title the Ottomans claimed and, and, and attempted to use. How important it was to their actual legitimacy is uh, open to question and probably was not all that important. Um, the question of the legitimacy of the Ottomans as uh, rightful Muslim leaders became a big problem. Um, in the 18th and in the 19th centuries with the emergence of um, the Wahhabi movement in uh, Arabia. This is the interpretation of Islam that now is dominant in, in Saudi Arabia. And um, they did not regard uh, the Ottomans as legitimate rulers. Uh, so you had also Sunni Muslims uh, for religious reasons rising up against uh, the Ottomans. Uh, something that the, uh, today, the, uh, to the extent that the uh, the Wahhabi interpretation of Islam is uh, effectively a fundamentalist interpretation of, of Islam, differed from the sort of the, the, the practice of the mainstream practice of Islam uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you'll find uh, some Turkish Muslims who will refer to the fact that, well, you know, so we hang the bastards, that is, the, the Wahhabis, when they were suppressed as rebellions. Um, we know we, we've had our own problems dealing with these guys. Uh, these fanatics, their Islam is not ours, and um, we know this better than you, the Americans. Um, uh, so I guess maybe if I could uh, think the response to the question would be, um, certainly there are major doubts among many uh, Sunni Muslims about the Ottomans' claim to legitimacy as uh, Muslim rulers, and this created problems for their empire and its rule. Um, your question was about, um, right, the, the question of the, the, the sources of law. And on that, I think I, I can't really give a definitive answer to that, uh, not being an, an expert on um, Islamic law. We have a question over here. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Christina Cohn, and uh, back to Julie's question for a moment about the top reasons for the, the collapse of the empire. Um, you know, the, the narrative that I'm familiar with is the, you know, falling behind in the military, and actually, incorrectly now, I, I realize with the, the, what I thought were nationalistic uprisings, and now I see the, the other. Um, but what I, I was expecting you to talk about was something um, about the policy of succession not being, not being very clear, and that wasn't brought up by you, and I, I'm now wondering if, if I'm under the wrong impression that that was a big issue. So the, the question of succession of the sultans? Yeah. Um, not, not for, not, not, that had no major impact on the, um, uh, the decline, the, 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 the breakup of the empire, the dismember of the empire. That, that, the sultans by the, so by the end of the, towards the end of the 19th century, um, one that was no longer, maybe I, I should preface this by pointing out to, this is always a question, a big question and problem for the Ottomans. Um, a succession of the sultan. Um, there would uh, any given sultan would have a lot of brothers, and they would all have claim uh, to the uh, throne. And so, with the death of each sultan, then they go, who's going to be a successor? And there would be a struggle, which often the uh, way that they traditionally ended it for some time early on was through bowstringing. That is, they would strangle uh, the other uh, rivals, um, so they'd be uh, children, etc. Um, until one was, was left standing. And this was oftentimes a problem for the Ottomans uh, in the earlier centuries. But later, by the time of the 19th century, the sult one, they, they don't have, the, the bowstringing um, has stopped. And um, the palace has become more important as the bureaucracy. And the sultans essentially become more of a, um, uh, a, f a figurehead of, of, of sorts. So the question of Ottoman succession was a, that was a problem earlier in the earlier centuries of the empire. Uh, but does, doesn't play a role in, in the dismemberment. Yes, I'm Javier Ergueta, and I wonder uh, to what extent was the uh, Sufi strand of Islam uh, a part of the story here? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so Sufism, or sort of mystical Islam, uh, plays a big role in the Ottoman Empire and in Turkish culture, uh, I think it's fair to say, in, in, in general. Um, one of the, I mean, often a common uh, mistake that is made uh, in commenting upon Islam is to draw, I think, too much of a distinction between the formal Islam uh, and Sufism or mystical uh, Islam, as if the two are in rivalry or contention, when most of the major Sufi brotherhoods, uh, in fact, uh, subscribe to um, could say conventional um, uh, doctrinal um, Islam. So that in the Ottoman Empire, you would often find, um, we quite finally find the uh, religious scholars, that is those who pronounce on questions of doctrine and on law, uh, the ulama, were also, in addition to, to uh, serving as authorities on uh, Islamic texts and Islamic law, were also practitioners of me uh, mystical Islam, of Sufism and would belong not to one, but oftentimes several different uh, brotherhoods. So the two forms of Islam complemented each other. Um, and you know, you'll sometimes find um, people trying to draw a distinction uh, between the two forms. And more often than not, actually, the two forms uh, complement each other. You do find uh, various interpretations uh, uh, by Sufis of Islam, wherein they essentially say, well, we're beyond um, the uh, formal uh, requirements of Islam. And we don't have to pay attention to those things. Such, so therefore, we don't really have to fast because we have a, a direct access to God through our mystical practices. And that creates problems uh, with, the, uh, with the ulama, um, um, with those who, who follow more, a more doctrinal uh, version of Islam. But that's more the exception than the rule when you find this, the, the, this conflict. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, no, in, in terms of, no, in term, religion isn't. Uh, in, in I'm terms, sorry, I was asked to repeat that. Um, and in the development of the tensions that led to the breakup of the empire? No, I, I don't think that um, any uh, inter-Islamic dispute, um, not even the Shia Sunni dispute, um, contributed much to the breakup of the empire. In fact, in the latter you know, decades of the empire, there was much more of a um, pan-Islamic um, uh, solidarity 
That is, at, the, at this time, the Ottomans began to see the, uh, the Persians not as rivals, but in fact as, as fellow uh, victims of European imperialism as the British and the Russians uh, came in, uh, into Iran. And uh, you had a number of uh, prominent writers at the time were emphasizing, look, she Sunni doesn't make a difference. We've got to bind together because we have the same um, we have the same opponents, and that and, and that's the European imperialists. And um, in terms of Sufism, um, you know, the, you you might find some you would find some um, Sunni today radicals who would say uh, who might argue that um, Sufism uh, contributed to the decline of the Ottoman Empire. That is, the, because the Ottomans weren't practicing the proper form of Islam, they therefore were punished by God, and they lost their empire. But I, there's not much, I don't think, real evidence to support that thesis. Well, Michael, I'm teaching European diplomatic history uh, this semester uh, from the French Revolution to the First World War. I've taught it many times before, uh, and I, of course, am uh, int introducing my students at great length to the Eastern question, mm -hmm. which is what really this is all about from the European perspective, was to become of that whole Middle East area uh, as the Ottoman Empire gradually collapses, who's going to fill the power vacuum. And it's usually told in terms of the great rivalry of the great powers, um, the imperial rivalry between Britain and Russia, and uh, of course I suppose many uh, people in that, in that region today would blame all of its troubles on the European imposition. So the great turning point, it seems to me, from the perspective of the West, is when the Ottoman Empire ceased to be seen as a threat and came to be seen as a temptation. And we can argue about the dates, uh, the Russo-Turkish War of the 1770s, or uh, Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1799 must have been a great turning point. Um, but in particular, uh, the Eastern question really gets going with the revolt of the Fenariot Greeks in 1821 and on down through the 1820s. And um, then, of course, we know about the monks' quarrel that led to the Crimean War in the 1850s, where the rights of very different Christian millets are c conflicting with each other, uh, and the European powers come in to back one side or the other, the French, the Roman Catholics, the Russians, the Orthodox. Um, and then on down uh, through the various Balkan revolts of the, uh, of the well, the 1875 and, and then the Congress of Berlin that settles that. Um, and as I say, it's, this is usually depicted as a, a grand story of European predation, which the Ottoman Turks uh, uh, are unable to, to cope with. Um, uh, but there's another story there that I realized this year for the first time in my long life, uh, you always learn something new. Uh, and that is that this story can also be told as the gradual evolution, not of European imperialism alone, but of European humanitarian intervention. We think of this as something that's only come about uh, after the Cold War. Uh, and now it's become, it's become uh, uh, legislated, if you will, by the UN and the R2P, the Responsibility to Protect. Uh, that when a government is oppressing its, the human rights of its own people, that the international community has an obligation to come in and, help, and, 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 and save those people. Well, that's precisely the justification that the, the British um, uh, uh, um, Phil Hellenes, uh, and then later on in the 1850s, uh, uh, the, the British and the French, uh, and indeed the Tsarist Russians. We don't usually think of them as humanitarians. But that's exactly what the Russians argued that they were doing whenever they would go to war against Turkey. So is this a, co a counter narrative, you might say, that, that really I said, sheds a lot more light on the present day and uh, also would become far more explicable, I think, to our students? That is a uh, super uh, question. Um, and that's it's a, um, because it, it, is, it strikes me as a historian of the Ottoman Empire, particularly the late era, how we see precisely the same. And we're talking about Syria, the question of humanitarian intervention in Syria. And all I can think of is, is the uh, debates in the 19th century about uh, humanitarian intervention in Levant, and then again, Eastern Anatolia. Um, uh, and uh, I, my, I don't think these are two, they're two counter narratives. I see them as complementary. That is, uh, the story of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire was, um, it's a story of, um, on the one hand, uh, the growth in European power and then the European uh, imperialism dismembering the Ottoman Empire. 
At the same time, there is, it's also a story, this question of humanitarian intervention, that is a lot of uh, populations in the Ottoman Empire are growing more uh, dissatisfied uh, with Ottoman rule, and uh, in particular with the Ottoman uh, efforts at centralization. And the two, they can't be separated. That is, um, there were humanitarian problems in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Armenian question uh, was, uh, you could talk at, at, at length about that one. Um, but that does the question, the humanitarian interventions were also very much bound up with uh, imperial projects um, a, a, as well. So uh, there were both real problems in, in the Ottoman Empire that outside powers uh, would often exploit uh, for their own benefit. Likewise, the Ottomans would, would sometimes uh, conduct uh, massacres, et cetera, of, of subject populations um, for reasons of uh, grand you know, geopolitics. Um, so the, the two narratives really need to be seen uh, together. That is, not all, you know, there, there was legitimate uh, European concern about some of these populations. At the same time, much of the humanitarian intervention was clearly um, uh, guided by um, uh, you know, geopolitical concerns that were really, uh, had nothing, uh, that didn't relate to the concerns of the, of the local populations. And in many ways, um, the outside interve interventions actually arguably made things worse for the local populations. Um, and pr primarily, these are Christian populations, um, but both in Greece, then uh, in, in the Levant, and then in, in, in Eastern Anatolia. Um, you know, you, some of those populations, though, might say, well, the, the problem was not so much the interventions were uh, took place, but rather they didn't. There wasn't strong enough intervention, and that's something if we could rerun history and try stronger intervention, less intervention, see how it worked out for those populations. Um, uh, would, um, <clears throat> would 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 um, then we could we could answer that question. I, one thing I might mention is then the questions of humanitarian interventions. Is, this was a problem, and Ottomans wrote at length about this. Uh, what really uh, uh, you know, irritates not not is, is too light a word. Uh, what really bothered them was the fact that the, the the subjects of this intervention were Christians. That there was no concern given to the um, uh, Muslims who were expelled from. Um, the Balkans and the Caucasus. And the Ottomans I spoke about this out you know, in the 19th century and 20th century. There's a clear double standard um, uh, going on here. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hi, my name is David Kuzma. My question was about the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, your, your map, the, your multicolored map from before. And my question really was, did the local populations see benefit as they became part of the Ottoman Empire? And if so, later on when you talk about flexibility and uh, the tolerance, at what point did they no longer see that as a benefit and were attracted to European uh, you know, control? Right, that's, that, that's, that's an excellent, um, excellent question. Of, you know, in terms of the expansion, you know, the, I mentioned in the stability of the Ottomans, their tolerance and their flexibility, of course, they should point out is the Ottoman military machine, um, which is what really uh, explains their uh, primary cause of their uh, su successful uh, expansion, which I won't go into. This is the Janissaries, et cetera. So they had a very good uh, military, um, <clears throat> both technologically and in terms of its uh, organization. So they were uh, a wonderful uh, army. Um, but another factor, right, as you brought up, many oftentimes uh, the subject populations were actually quite happy uh, to have uh, the Ottomans come in and kick out their uh, previous uh, rulers. Um, <clears throat> so dis disaffection with uh, prior rule, um, and this is not a, uh, an uncommon story, um, assisted the Ottomans as they came in. And I think you know, later than how does the, the uh, change in attitudes towards the Ottomans uh, take place again, I think it's, it's the imposition of direct rule by the empire um, where they begin making more, imposing more demands upon the local populations that uh, stimulates many of them to say, well, the heck with this, um, you know, why should we remain part of this empire? And, and then with the fact that they have a real op option for leaving the empire. Uh, when they say, okay, the Europeans are getting stronger, uh, you know, the Austro-Hungarians, the Russians, the, the British, the French are, are all on the horizon, and we can uh, get support from them uh, and, and break away from the Ottoman Empire. You know, when you have that option, then suddenly what you're willing to, to put up with uh,
changes. Does that answer your question? Okay, well, thank you very much.